I think we should probably start with a sound check. Can people actually hear me? Hooray! Success. So, <clears throat> so I want to start the timer. So, uh, my name is Meredith, and uh, I'm very pleased. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, pleased to be here. I'm going to be talking about uh, Anvil, which is a platform for building web apps with nothing but Python. And before I like get into the nitty gritty of how it works, you might want to ask like why? Why is this a thing we want to do? And I will argue to you that the way we build web apps today, most of the time, is pretty broken, right? Just think about it from the point of view of your data, right? Your data probably starts as rows in a database table in a typical web app. You access it via SQL. You then read those from a database, turn them into objects on your server, probably in Python in present company, and they have methods and attributes to access them. But then, you, of course, you don't leave them as objects. You immediately turn them into JSON uh, and send them you know, over REST, with, over HTTP, with this very limited set of verbs, get, post, put, delete, and so on. And then at the other end of that HTTP connection is some JavaScript, which is going to reassemble that into objects, different objects in a different programming language with methods and attributes on their own. And then we have to transform that into HTML DOM for the browser to render. And then we use CSS to turn that into pixels. And that is a lot of different representations of your data. And there's a lot of transformation levels there, and all those transformations are tedious and repetitive. And what's worse than being tedious and repetitive is that they attract the wrong kind of magic. What do I mean by the wrong kind of magic? I'm going to illustrate by uh, taking a totally unfair pot shot at SQL Alchemy. Who in this room has used SQL Alchemy? Yeah, OK. Right, for those of you who haven't, it's a library for uh, representing a rows in an SQL database as Python objects. And this is an unfair pot shot because this is actually really cool. It lets you write expressions like this, right? Filter, book.price is less than 20. That's nice. But of course, transforming that Python expression into SQL you can run against a database is black magic. We are talking meta classes. We are talking uh, overloading ordinary Python operators to do something completely different to what they normally do. If you think that's a numerical comparison, you're in for a surprise. That is generating source code in a different programming language. And that's OK if you do it once. But if you have this level of magic at every layer of this stack, you are going to have a bad day. And of course, that's exactly what we do, right? We have ORMs like SQL Alchemy turning database rows into objects. We have REST frameworks helping us represent those objects over HTTP and JSON. We have JavaScript frameworks like Angular's resources turning those HTTP requests back into objects. We have templating engines to turn those objects into HTML DOM. We have CSS frameworks to turn those things into pixels. And every layer of those is the wrong sort of magic. Uh, it abuses the semantics of one layer to represent an adjacent layer. You need to learn it all, and it is brittle. I mean, we're Pythonistas here, right? How does that stack up against PEP20, the zen of Python? Simple is better than complex. That is not a simple system. If the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. Like, the insides of JavaScript frameworks are famously gnarly. They are not easy to explain. Here's a famous one. There should be one and preferably only one way to do it. Oh, boy. <laughs> right? So if the way we do web development is a mess, how should we do it? Well, this is what we do. We uh, take all of these nasty frameworks and we replace them all with Python. Uh, so what we have is. Uh, a visual UI builder where you can drag and drop components and you represent them as Python objects. Uh, Client-side code in the browser is written in Python. Uh, we translate that into JavaScript so you can just access your UI. You don't need to generate source code in a different programming language. You represent your UI as objects. Uh, Python on the server, of course, but if you have Python on the server and Python on the client, there's no reason to mash everything into JSON just to get it from one to the other. No, it's just a function call. We even have a JavaScript, uh, sorry, a Python native database um, so that you can access the database rows and tables as Python objects. So you can take a row from the database all the way from the database to the visual UI without having to change its representation, and that is very powerful. 
All right, so that's the idea of how it works. Let me show you what it looks like in practice. OK, let's switch over. So uh, here I am in the Anvil editor. I'm just going to show you, start by building like a simple Hello World app. So I'm creating a new app. I've chosen my visual theme. Uh, this here is a web page. And over here is a toolbox of things I can put onto that web page. So I'm going to put a title on by dragging a label, which is a component that displays some text, up into the title. I can then edit its properties. I can say its text should be Hello World. And that's how I put some text onto my page. All right, let's do something more exciting. I'm going to put a card on here. Uh, I'm going to uh, put... So what we're going to do is we're going to have an app where the user enters their name. Uh, and we uh, display a personalized greeting. So I'm going to add a, an input box so that it can answer that question. Uh, and a... Oh, hang on, we're going to give this a name. This text box, or we're going to call name box. Everything in Anvil has a name, so we can access it from code. Uh, we're going to have a button in here for them to click when they're done. Oh, no, not there. In here. There we go. OK. Say hello. And we can make this a bit more prominent. And you can see what's going to happen, right? They're going to enter their name, click a button, and a message is going to appear. So that our last thing is going to be a label for that message to appear on. I'm going to call it message label because I lack all creativity. Uh, and we can say this is going to be centered and make the font size big and so on. So we've just built a web page. And that's an awful lot faster than you could have done it in HTML and CSS. But the really cool thing is that every part of this is backed by Python. So if I double click this button, I'm editing the Python code that runs when that button gets clicked. And you can see all the things I dragged and dropped onto the screen are available as variables in my Python code. So if I want to change the text on that message label based on the text that's been entered in the name box, I go self.messagelabel.text. Hello. Self.namebox.text. That's it. Um, OK, so. So. We've just built a web application in a very short period of time. In fact, it's already live online. Let me try pointing this slightly more towards myself. Uh, it's already live online. Uh, this is its URL. This is like one of those Google Docs URLs. So if you don't have the URL, you can't access it. But I can set it as public. Hello, PyCon SK. OK, you could go to hello-pyconsk.anvil.app on your phone or your computer right now, and that app is live. We have built and published a web app in, actually, the time has stopped. Someone could, re, uh, someone could uh, start that iPad screen again. Uh, I don't know exactly how long, but it was not long. OK, so that's fine. Uh, but this all happens in the browser. Remember, this Python actually gets compiled to JavaScript and runs in the web browser. And any serious application is going to need some server-side code as well. So uh, what do we do? Well, we can add server modules. And this is an ordinary Python module that happens to run on our server. Ordinary Python module, ordinary Python function. It takes a name parameter. No, nope, I can't spell. Uh, can people read that? Hands up if you can't read it. OK. Better? There we go. OK. So uh, what we do, this is an ordinary Python function, but we tag this anvil.server.callable. And we say, so this says, this function on the server, we should be able to call it from the browser. So if we go back to our client-side code, as well as updating the UI, we go anvil.server.call. And we call the say hello function. Uh, we, uh, it has a parameter name, so we pass in the text from this name box. And now if we run this, and I enter my name, you can see we've got something in the, out in the output in the log file. So now we've got some code running on the server being driven by this Python user interface we've built. Uh, and sure, this is kind of limited, right? There's only so much we can compile to JavaScript. Uh, you know, you can't open files and so on. Uh, but this is a real, I'm sorry. 
this is a real uh, CPython 3.7 running on the server, and you know it's got the full set. You know, you want to do act as a database, import PyMySQL, import PyMongo, connect, go. Uh, I want to do some numerical processing, import NumPy. I want to plot a graph, import matplotlib. It's you know batteries included. Uh, in practice, the first thing everybody asks is, how do I access a database? So we actually have a database built in. You don't have to use it, but you can. Uh, this is backed by uh, Postgres, so this is not a toy. You can put terabytes into this thing if you want to. Uh, today, I'm going to do something slightly less exciting. I'm just going to store uh, all the names that get entered. So we'll want a text column for the name, and we'll want a date and date time column for when it was they signed up. Uh, and we, that's it. I've designed our database. Uh, this table is app tables.visitors. So it's accessible from our code in exactly the same way as those text boxes and buttons were. So if I go into the server code, as well as uh, updating, uh, printing this into the log file, uh, we can take app tables.visitors and we can add a row to it. We fill out the name column with the name that's been passed in. We fill out the when column with date time.now. I've got to import that. And now if we run this, if we go to the database, you can see we've just uh, we've recorded those names. So we've just built and published. Remember, this is online. You could use this from your phone now. We have built and published a database-backed web application in Python in a very, very short space of time. I'm going to show you one more thing before we get on to showing you how it works underneath, uh, which is how you display data back from the database. Uh, so remember, we could just return rows from this database all the way to the client. So uh, if we want to display a table of who's entered their name before, we just make a callable function, uh, get visitors, oh, and we have it return app tables dot visitors dot search which is if we don't try any query it's going to return everything and then if we go back to the UI go back to our design uh, I'm going to add a data table here uh, sorry data grid uh, and it's going to have one column for the name it's going to pull name column out it's going to cover column for when entered uh, the key is going to be when and we don't need this third column. We can adjust these and so on. Okay, so in this grid is something called a repeating panel. And a repeating panel is a neat component that has got a property called items. And you give that anything you can iterate over in Python. And once you set the items, it will repeat this template for every element in that list. Uh, so here in the init method, we, set, we can set the repeating panel's items to oh, the return value of the get visitors function. And now we're displaying data from our database on our page. Simple as that. One last thing. Uh, this date's kind of ugly, right? We're taking a stir of uh, a date time, and that does not look good. Uh, we'd like to, you know, to format that date nicely. So we go and we edit the template. And instead of the default thing for that column, we put a label in here. And then we set the data bindings. This is, of course, just a Python expression. So self.item is a row from the visitor table. That is our database row. It's been passed all the way from the server to the client. We can just pull out the when column. And of course, that's a date time. So we can call the standard Python library functions. So if we run this now, we formatted the date. And excellent. Oh, someone's been trying our Unicode support. Bravo to you. So you can see I've just built and shipped the database-backed web app in a very short period of time. And you've used it so you know I am not lying. So let's see if the remote mic's working. I'm now going to talk a little bit about how that works uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so if someone could pass me my water bottle, that would be great. Um, so I'm going to talk 
This is sort of a, a set of mini tech talks about how parts of Anvil work underneath. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with compiling Python to JavaScript because uh, this is obviously one of the major things. If you want to write your full stack application with nothing but Python, then you're going to need to run code in the browser. And if you're running code in the browser, it has to be in JavaScript. Uh, so we need to somehow translate Python to JavaScript. Thankfully, there's an open source compiler called Sculpt. It's a Python to JavaScript compiler. Uh, and it does what you'd expect. You feed it a Python expression, and it will produce a JavaScript expression that does the same thing. You feed it a Python function, and it will produce, honestly, it will produce the ugliest JavaScript function you have ever seen, but it will do what that Python function does. And this is great, but there is one problem. JavaScript, in its infinite wisdom, is a 100% non-blocking language, right? You cannot block partway through a function to go you know, check a database or fetch something from the web. And you know, you've seen me doing blocking operations, right? I've made calls to the server and then just used the return value. I haven't used, had to use callbacks. And that's something we'd like, right? Uh, get a more concrete example. You know, here's, here is an API you might easily write in Python, right? You get something from a database, and then you perform some computation on it. Here is what that looks like in JavaScript. I count one, two, three nested callbacks. And in case somebody thinks I'm being unfair to JavaScript here, this was copied and pasted from the first page of the Postgres JavaScript documentation. But we have a Python to JavaScript compiler. So we could translate that into that automatically, right? So let's get clone and get going. It turns out that Sculpt has a classic compiler architecture based, unsurprisingly, on CPython. Uh, so what you do is you take a, uh, a Python expression or module. Uh, you then, it then breaks it up into uh, bits of text that correspond to sensible units in Python. These, by the way, these JavaScript file names, that's the source within the Sculpt compiler if you want to follow along at home. Uh, and then it assembles this into an abstract syntax tree, which is a tree of operations that represent, you know, things that we would make, we would think make sense in Python. So, you know, here it's an assignment. We are the thing we're assigning to is a variable called results. The thing, we, the value we are assigning it from is, uh, you know, it's a function call. We are calling the function called f, and we're passing these arguments and so on. And then there's a compiler that walks over this tree, emitting JavaScript. So it's pretty clear that this is the thing that we're going to have to modify if we want to support blocking execution. So remember that this compiler has to produce a JavaScript function for every Python function, which means that it has to return. So what we do is we invent a new return type. And we say that if the JavaScript function returns something of this type, then uh, it's, it's saying, I've returned, but I'm not done yet. I've just blocked. And we call this a type a suspension. And so what we do is how we compile this call is we make the call, and then we check, is the response a suspension? If the response is a suspension, then we save all our temporary variables, we save all our local variables, we save where we are in the function, we wrap that all up in a suspension of our own, and then we return that. So here's, that, here, uh, here's how that looks in a slightly more real-world example. So we've got this button one click function. Uh, it's calling get, which is calling into the database, and the database is blocked. It's, you know, it has to go back and get some data. So get realizes it's been given a suspension. It saves its local, saves its variables, saves its uh, temporaries, it saves where it is in the function, and then it returns that as a new suspension that wraps the inner one. Button one click, again, the generated code realizes it's been given a suspension, so it saves its locals, it saves its temporaries. Uh, and it returns a suspension of its own. And then the JavaScript sits on it because we've finished executing. Of course, a, full, a few milliseconds later, the database comes back and says, got your data. And so the JavaScript resumes that suspension, which jumps to the right place in the function, restores all the locals, restores all the temporaries, and then resumes the suspension, which jumps to the right place in get, restores all its locals, restores all its temporaries, calls into uh, to resume the database call, which, of course, returns immediately with the data. And now we're back to normal execution. And that's how we turn blocking Python into non-blocking JavaScript. Yes, uh, sculpt.org is the website. We are always looking for new contributors. I'm one of the maintainers. Um, 
uh, please do get in touch if you want to join in. Here's another thing you saw me doing out there. I was making these calls from client to server, right? Just uh, managing to skip, you know, in an ordinary web app, that would be like routing and REST endpoints and JSON mashing. Here, it's just a call. We go anvil.server.call. We give it a function name and we give it some arguments. It, you know, it's a Python call. We've got positional arguments. We've got keyword arguments. We've got return values. And, well, how do we do that? So it's blocking, so it uses suspensions, obviously, if you're in the browser. Uh, we, what we actually do is we do a remote procedure call over WebSockets, uh, and you know, we encode the arguments and the return values as JSON, uh, which is fine for the, thing, the values you see there, right? These are all JSONable values. But what about values that aren't JSONable, right? Uh, you saw me throwing database rows around there, just you know, like they were ordinary return values from a function. And this is obviously something we want to do. And the question is, how do we do it? Uh, and yeah, you know, okay, just another illustration. You know, we have something in the database. We want to get things out of that database, and we want to be able to return those values all the way back to the client as simple return values. So. The way we do this is we have a concept we call live objects, which is this is a, a type of data that you can pass to and from these server functions. Uh, and the important things about live objects is that they represent a server-side resource. So uh, you know, any client-side state is just cache, right? That object is the database row. They have to be secure because. Just because we're allowing the client code to call methods on a database row doesn't mean that the client code should be able to call methods on any database row. Otherwise, every, data, every visitor has access to our whole database, which isn't exactly what we wanted. Uh, so what we do is we adopt the rule that possession is permission. So this is in computer science, we call this a capability model. The idea is that if I've been given the object, then I have access to the object. So if I returned that object from a server function to the client, that was me giving permission to the client code to access it. And what this means is you don't have to manage your permissions separately from passing these objects around. So uh, this is how it's actually implemented. So every live object has an identifier. You know, this is this table, this row. It's got some methods we can call on it, you know, updates, delete, a get item, which is, yeah, lets you access things as square brackets, set item, and so on. And of course, a set of permissions, in this case, read only. And then what we do is we take a digital signature over the whole live object with a key that is known only to the server. And so every time we send a live object to the client, it's signed. And when the client passes a live object back to the server, then we can check the signature. And if the signature matches, then we know that must have been an object we gave it. Because you know, if it didn't come from us, the signature wouldn't be right. It's not for non-forgeable, we say. And so this means that we can uh, safely put the, give these things to the client, have them pass back, and trust what the client is giving us. So here's what the API ends up looking like. Uh, so uh, this is a simple server function. You know, we're looking for a person with a given name. We check whether we are logged in using the Anvil built-in user authentication system. I don't have time to show you, but it's awesome. Um, and we return a, uh, we get a row from the database and we return that uh, only if the user's logged in. And of course, on the client, that means we can just call the get person function. We get this database row and we can call methods. In this case, get item on that row. Again, right, the server has chosen whether to return it with that if statement. So we've applied security, but that's the only, you know, we didn't need to do permissions separately. We just chose whether to give you that object. We can, of course, be more clever than this. We can set permissions. So we don't have to be read only all the time. Uh, this function returns a writable version of that database row. So it takes the people, app table, .people table, it takes a client writable version of that table, and then it searches that. And so the rows you get from that are going to be client writable. And so if you get this in the client, you can get this person value and you can just increment its age. So this means that we can edit the database from the browser. From, we can edit the database from the code that handles button clicks. 
In a traditional web application, every operation you want to perform, you need to implement it at every one of those five layers. Sorry, six layers, even. And here, we can just do it from our button click handler. That's going to save you a lot of work. We can get even cleverer still. We can turn views on tables, because, of course, data tables are live objects, too. So here's an example. We, so we get the current user. If we are logged in, we get a client writable view of the records table, but only of the rows where the owner is the current user. And what that returns is something we can use like a data table, right? We can get this records object out. We can add rows. We can search it. We can delete things. But we can only add rows with that value in the owner column, and we can only search rows with that value in the owner column. So we've just delegated a whole chunk of our database to client code for it to operate on directly. And there's a huge number of operations we just don't even have to write server things for. And again, it's because we've got this capability model that lets us delegate permission to the, to the place where it's most convenient to write the code, rather than writing the code where it's most convenient for the framework. OK. Uh, I'm going to finish by talking about, uh, frankly, this is my favorite little mini tech talk in, uh, about Anvil. Uh, this is uh, about the autocompleter. So you saw, um, as I was uh, typing in that demo there, you know, it was code completing everything I wrote. And this is really, really important, right? Autocompletion is great. Hang on. Hands up here who uses something like PyCharm. OK. Hands up here who are the Emacs and Vim diehards. Hey, OK, a few of you. Right. So, uh, so I'm mostly preaching to the choir here, but I will say it. Autocomplete is great. Autocomplete is great because it gives you discoverability. It lets you discover what's in an API without having to check the documentation every time. It gives you speed because you can hit three letters and hit the tab key. It gives you confidence that what you're doing is right because there are whole classes of bugs that you can eliminate without, you, without even hitting the run button because the autocompleter has warned you that, you know, that's not how you spell that word. Or, you know, this variable wasn't the type you expected it to be. And for all those reasons, it feels good to use. Uh, confession, we originally built Anvil without autocomplete. We thought we could get away without it. I'm here to tell you we were wrong. Autocomplete is essential. And if you are one of those diehards who put your hand up and you're still using Emacs or Vim or something that doesn't have autocomplete, I beg you, get Jedi as a plugin or any of the similar plugins you can get. Just do, if you remember nothing else from this talk, do me a favor, try it for a week. It will change your life. Unfortunately for us, um, these off the shelf autocompleters weren't quite sufficient. Uh, a couple of reasons. One is, of course, that Anvil's full stack. So we need your autocompleter to know about your database and know about your server code and know about your client code, know about you know, what things you dragged and dropped onto that editor. Which, I mean, you know, we, we could have patched that in, but the real issue is that Anvil is, of course, in the web browser. And when you're in the web browser and you're hitting the tab key, there is just not enough time to go back to the server, parse all, the, uh, parse all your code, for, come up with autocompletions and send them back. So uh, we ended up having to implement our own in JavaScript. So here I am opening a Python conference by talking about my JavaScript project. Please don't throw anything at me. Uh, conveniently, of course, I mean, you know, this would be a really daunting undertaking, except we've got a Python to JavaScript compiler lying around. So you've already seen how we can use Sculpt to turn uh, a, set, a Python module into an abstract syntax tree, and that's exactly what we do. So when you hit the tab key, we replace your cursor with a random symbol, and then we throw the whole thing into Sculpt. And it comes out with an abstract syntax tree. Uh, and we can then recursively walk that tree and keep a, build up a representation of all the variables that are in scope at every point in your code. And then when we hit the name node containing our magic cursor symbol, we go, well, what are all the variables in scope? We can offer those as our completions. Of course, uh, we, you know, variables aren't the only thing we can complete, right? 
Uh, you saw me uh, when I was accessing the database rows, right? We were auto-completing, um, you know, uh, the items available in get item square bracket lookups. In fact, there's a bunch in this because here we're auto-completing, you know, the, the attributes for app tables users. Got search. We're we're working out, you know, what you what types you get when you uh, when you call that function. Uh, we're working out what type you get when you iterate over that result, and then we're pulling out uh, the possible square bracket lookups. Uh, speaking of function calls, of course, you don't just want to know what a function, what type a function returns, right? You want to be able to autocomplete these arguments as well. And you want, of course, we want to do it across server and client, which is another thing that traditional web stuff can't do, which is why we're missing autocomplete in the world. You know, we had autocomplete in the 1990s, and now all these web developers are doing without it because they, the environments can't work out what the server's doing. Anyway, here's an example, right? We have a server function called say hello. Um, we're passing a dictionary into it, and we really want to be able to autocomplete the arguments in this. And so how we do this is uh, we actually... When we're parsing a module, as well as uh, keeping, um, as well as keeping the, the top level scope of that module, so that's you know all the functions and classes and so on that are defined, um, we can you know because we need that for because that's what you get if you import that module. We also store all the outbound calls, so we store all the function calls that module makes. And that means that when we pass that client module, we store that function call, and when we're passing the server module. Uh, we go, oh, we're, we're parsing the say hello server function. We know what arguments that gets called with. And so we pull that out, drop it into the local scope where it autocompletes. Uh, we autocomplete an awful lot about Python types. And this leads to a rather philosophical question about what exactly a type is. Because you could say, oh, well, the type of a Python object is its class. But we all know Python's a more dynamic language than that. We can, you know, you can dynamically add attributes onto individual object instances. And, and you know, even when two things are the same class and you haven't done something like that, I mean, are these two variables the same type? We certainly want to autocomplete them differently. So what we do is we actually say, kind of forget about the uh, class of these objects. We duck type our autocompleter. As far as our autocompleter is concerned, these two things are two different types, and they will be autocompleted separately. Obviously, they share a bunch of um, methods, but they are two different types. So I would like to, oh, you know what? I'm going faster than I thought. I'm going to demo um, the thing that I was really sorry I had to miss out. Um, this is something called the uplink, and I'm doing this specially for Jan, who wanted to do something with hardware. Uh, so. Uh, if uh, you are if you write these server modules in Anvil, you didn't notice I didn't have to run anything, I didn't have to set anything up. It all ran on our in our servers, which is great for getting something running quickly. But sometimes you want to run your code somewhere else, right? You might be doing a big machine learning job. You want to run it on a machine with you know 20 GPUs out there in AWS, or maybe you're working with individual hardware. Uh, so. Uh, and we have a way of doing that. You can connect your Python code running anywhere uh, to Anvil. And how we do this is something called the uplink. So this is a library you can pip install anywhere in the world. And if you enable it for your app, you get an uplink key. And if you call anvil.server.connect with that key, from wherever your code is running, your code is part of the Anvil app. And you can do all the things you've just seen me do in server code, you can do from wherever your code is running. You can make callable functions. You can access data tables. You can call other functions. The works. So let's show it to you. Uh, right. Uh, we want to this code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up a Python interpreter. Uh, nope, that was not what I wanted to do. Try that again. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, I see. Right. So. Uh, OK, get into a virtual environment. Pip install anvil uplink. Of course, it's already installed in this environment. Let's start a Python interpreter. Ooh, we're in Python 2 today. OK, fine, whatever. Um, 
So, I've called anvil.server.connect, I've connected, we are authenticated, we are now part of this app. I can define a function. I'm calling it say hi. Okay, so that uh, just a simple function that runs that's running on my machine. I've defined it on this laptop on this podium. And now, if I edit this code, when you click the button, instead of calling say hello, I call say hi. And I run this. We've just run code on this laptop from the cloud. And anybody else who's still got that, got that app open on their, uh, on their computers can make something appear on my terminal right now. And of course, you can use this, you know, you can use this on a server somewhere out there running beefy compute jobs, or you can use it on a Raspberry Pi that's controlling your curtains or controlling an industrial process. Okay, that was my indulgent side, uh, side part. So, I've shown you a few things about Anvil and how they work underneath. And before I stop and take questions, I'd like to finish by talking a little bit about the why of Anvil, the design philosophy that's guided everything I've shown you so far today. And there are two big principles involved here. The first is that code is good. We are telling a computer what to do. And in nearly a century of working with computers, humanity has found the best thing we have is writing text in a programming language. Uh, you will periodically encounter something that will say, oh, I can, you know, you can write code, oh, sorry, write apps without writing any code. And this is nearly always a false promise. Uh, you'll end up with, uh, a system that you know won't support all of what you need, uh, or worse, you will find yourself in a you know tangled up in flowcharts, shaking your monitor, yelling, "Let me write the blasted for loop!" And so we let you write the blasted for loop, get you to the code as soon as possible. Even in the UI designer, do you remember right back at the beginning when I was building that table of previous visitors and I was formatting the date? for when the user had signed. I wasn't dragging and dropping some wibbly line from a database. No, I wrote a Python expression, even in the visual designer. And what that meant, of course, was that I had all the power of the full Python libraries at my fingertips. Get me to the code, code is good. The second big principle is that we need to be accessible. I've already ranted a bit about how the web isn't accessible, but let's be clear. We need to be simple enough for novices. It is frankly a disgrace that the greatest application delivery platform on earth, the web, you need to learn five different programming languages just to get started. That is not acceptable. We need to be simple enough for novices to use. But that's only half of accessibility because to be properly accessible, you need to be simple enough for novices and you need to be powerful enough for seasoned professionals. Uh, this is partially for the novice's benefit, actually, because if you say, oh, here's something that's easy to use, but you're, you know, you're in the kiddie section, you're in the playpen, then you've stopped those people growing. You, know, you need to let them grow their powers. But also, you know, seasoned professionals, we need some love too, right? Just because I can write five different programming languages doesn't mean I want to, and it certainly doesn't mean that my boss wants to wait for me to do it. And you might look at this and think, yeah, sure, but these are incompatible goals. And I want to say that that is wrong. And it should be obvious to everybody in this room that that is wrong, because Python does it, right? The reason that we are all in this room, the Python programming language, is the first thing that you will show an eight-year-old in their first lesson with a Raspberry Pi and it's what Instagram used, and it's what Google DeepMind used to beat the human brain at the game of Go for the first time in history. 
Python shows us it is possible in, for something to be simple enough for novices and powerful enough for seasoned pros. And it is only the garbage fire of traditional web development that makes us doubt it. Thank you very much. I will, before I go into questions, I will go for a brief plug. If you're interested in what you've seen and you want to get hands on with this, we are leading a workshop at 1310 today in the Hall B. I'm not going to try to pronounce that because I'm going to butcher the Slovak. My apologies. Um, but please do come in and join and uh, see what it's like to actually use. All right, time to move on to questions. Should I just read these from the... Uh... If I may do that. Those are some fantastic words that I con concluded with. You know, uh, why should we learn five different programming languages just to just to work on the on the biggest platform? And and um, and yeah, it is Python is an excellent example of showing something can be both simple and powerful. Uh, there are a couple of questions that that you have received. The one with the most upvotes. Um, this appears to be a proprietary closed framework. Why would I rely on a non-open source, albeit very exciting product? Seems very risky. Uh, try to convince me. Ah. Right, okay, so the short version of this is that um, there is a really great way to get a very, very full-featured open source framework, and that's to have a bunch of venture capitalists fund a company, try to build something, then make it open source, try to make some money out of it, and as 99% of them do, fail. Um, don't get me wrong, I would love to open source Anvil if, but... The market has busily shown us, I, I used to say that uh, the market has, bu has been busy showing us that there is room for precisely one large, open, you know, large successful open source company, and that's Red Hat, Red Hat sponsors today. Only even they got bought by IBM a few weeks ago. So it's, it is very, very tough. Look at Docker, right? Docker have transformed their industry, and uh, they, make, they, you know, they haven't made a profit. They make basically no revenue uh, because... Uh, their value ends up getting captured by commercial offer, uh, offerings on top. So I would argue that, in fact, it being a paid product and the fact that we are, in fact, you know, a profitable startup means that it is likely to stay around longer than your average VC-funded open source project. And you're going to need some kind of funding if you want to build something this big. This was not a small undertaking. If I may do a follow-up here, uh, have you considered uh, taking other forms of financing like grants like Jupiter did or, or other uh, business models uh, that would make these, you know, that would help you also take off more? And, and uh, trust Yes, we have considered it. We have decided that they do not, in fact, help as much as we think we did. And I don't want to get into, like, sure. spend the rest of the day okay. talking about that. Uh, the next one. Uh, is it possible to run Anvil on own yes. servers or locally? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. Um, it goes Docker, uh, Docker Compose pull, Docker Compose up, and then you have a whole version of this running locally. Um, there's also the intermediate step. I showed you the uplink. You know, if you have something local, you have a local database that's sensitive, but you want to expose just like one or two queries on it, that's fine. You can write an uplink script that has a function that will perform the one or two queries you want to expose to your web app and keep the rest of your data private. But as I say, you know, if you need all your data on site, that's fine. We have on site stuff. Come talk to me afterwards. So you can run on-prem, fantastic. Um, what about the performance uh, of this approach? Uh, I, that was asked at a particular point during the, during the talk, and I can't remember um, what exactly it was talking about. So obviously, compiling Python to JavaScript is, uh, it is less fast than writing it directly in JavaScript. Um, we take, Sculpt takes this hit to provide a better Python emulation, right? You saw when I was compiling that string object, it was a sculpt built-in string object. I wasn't using JavaScript strings. That is so that we can preserve the Python semantics. Uh, in practice, uh, execution speed of the stuff that's running in the web browser is not usually our limiting factor. Ultimately, of course, um, uh, we're you know, uh, in the long term, once we're still waiting for a couple more things in the browser, but in the long term, Sculpt is probably going to shift to targeting WebAssembly, at which point it will be plenty fast. Uh, of course, on the server side, if that's what you're asking about, it's just CPython, right? It's got all your standard extensions. It runs like greased lightning. Who's your target group? Who is this product meant for? Uh, oh, there man. are some larger examples of Anvil being used in production. Yes, we do have examples. No, I can't talk about them in front of a crowded audience. I am really, you cannot, I cannot tell you how frustrated I am that I cannot drop some names here. Um, 
Yeah, so it's difficult to say who's it meant for because, of course, a programming tool by its nature is widely usable, right? We have people using Anvil everybody, everywhere from schools uh, using the free version. We have everything I've, you've seen me do in uh, today's demo can be done on the free version. Um, so the schools using the very capable free version. There's hobbyists. There's individuals working on a, um, you know, uh, building their own projects, people building startups, people who have built startups on Anvil and now have, you know, have millions of dollars and a team of people. Uh, and there are big companies using internal tools, um, uh, build, using it to build internal tools. Uh, I can't use an example on video. Um, and truly huge companies who are sufficiently paranoid that they need the on-premise installation. Um, Yes, there are big companies. I'm sorry, I cannot name them, especially while that video camera's running. <laughs> are we ready to take a, take a couple, couple more? Well, yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, we, we still have uh, uh -huh. nearly four minutes. Uh, you said that you are converting Python code to JS. Uh, isn't this also some kind of magic you mentioned before as a bad approach? So, okay. So, I specifically qualified as the wrong kind of magic. And the wrong kind of magic is... Something like an ORM is a really good example of this, although JavaScript frameworks do the same thing. The thing that makes that magic dangerous is that it abuses the semantics of the layer you're working on to represent an adjacent layer, right? You, that book dot price at less than 20 was not a numerical calculation. And if you try to think about it like a Python programmer, you're going to come unstuck. Fundamentally, if you want to use something like SQL Alchemy in production, you're going to have to understand Python, and understand SQL, and understand how SQL Alchemy does the translation. It is a very, very leaky abstraction. Uh, this is not true of a compiler, right? I do not need to understand how CPython works to write Python. I do not need to understand how Sculpt works to write Python. I do not need to understand JavaScript to use Anvil. And so this is a, a kind of abstraction we will stand behind. Um, can you give some example of a real website built by Anvil? Or maybe uh, a couple of websites? Pardon? Maybe a couple of websites? Or uh, like so there are some out there. Again, I'm really annoyed because obviously a lot of the biggest projects here are internal tools of, of companies that I can't show you even though they are really cool. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a startup called Lightning AI which have given us permission to, um, uh, to use their names. Uh, they have like an ad tech serving platform. Actually, they're a perfect example. It was, you know, a data scientist, a Pythonist uh, with, a, you know, maths masters who uh, needed, wanted to build an ad tech product. She had the statistics. That was her, you know, that was her thing. She didn't have the full, full stack web capability. It was going to cost her, what, the best part of $100,000 to get someone to build the, just the first prototype. And everybody knows the first prototype is not what you're actually going to want to ship. Instead of which she grabbed this and built it herself. Uh, Lightning AI is the thing to Google if you want to find them. There's more than a dozen more questions, uh, so... Well, yeah, um, I, I, uh, let me know when I run out of time. <laughs> okay, uh, if you'd like to continue, there's, uh, there's one question which is kind of hard to, to understand. Can you show us uh, the client yes, HTML source can. of that okay. example? So, uh, by the way, if I, if I may, uh, yes. when, you, when you write like, things like that example, it's useful if you, if you refer to a specific example so that yeah. you know, uh, so folks know. I don't know which example you're talking about, so I'm going to show you something generic. Come find me afterwards if uh, there was some, you meant something else. So a really important thing about Anvil, and the, the reason that the things that make it, um, see, it uh, powerful enough for seasoned professionals is that there's always an escape hatch to the low-level, high-powered tool, right? Uh, one example of this I sh didn't talk about is version control, right? Every Anvil app is a Git repository. I can check this out with Git and work with it on my local machine. Uh, it is properly version controlled. And another of the, these escape hatches that uh, let you use the power tools is that you can drop down and edit HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Uh, so here's an example. I'm going to go into the assets of my page, and I'm going to edit the HTML. Now, the crucial thing here is that we are not editing the HTML that comes out of Anvil. We are editing the HTML that goes in. And what that means is that when I make a change here, I have not broken my abstraction. I can edit this HTML and then go back into the drag and drop designer, and I can still use it. You know, you don't offer them the choice between easy for novices and powerful for seasoned pro. You offer them both at the same time. 
So uh, you saw when I started up, I chose like my visual theme and I chose like a Google material design theme. Uh, this is the HTML and the CSS that implements that theme. And I can go in and I can edit it. If you go onto our user forums, you can find lots of examples of people editing it to their satisfaction or creating like a you know, company house style. But again, anything you edit here will show up in the designer and you can still use the power tools alongside the easy to use stuff. Okay, fantastic. So let's give a hand to Meredith. Thank you very much.